if they are if they can be used as a reinforcement to precast concrete then the quality can be controlled in the manufacturing facility so <clears throat> as you can see in the right photo those these are some of the applications in in australia in in jetties in the uh, let's say detector loop at the Gold Coast Light Rail project, as well as a number of applications in marine environment. Also, GFRP bars has been used extensively as a reinforcement to the precast planks in the Pin Kimba Wharf in, in Brisbane. So this is the largest use of GFRP bars in Australia. So around 305 kilometers of GFRP bars were used as a reinforcement. And also in, in the University of Wollongong, their recently built molecular horizon buildings use GFRP bars as the main reinforcement in the foundation as well as to the second story because this particular building will house many uh, sophisticated as well as uh, very expensive equipment which are very sensi sensitive to electric as well as magnetic uh, conductivity. So these two infrastructures, they were designed based on the Canadian standard, but with reference to Australian standards in terms of loading conditions. And also recently, uh, USQ was engaged by the uh, Queensland Department of Main Roads to redesign their precast boat ramp planks. So traditionally, they are using galvanized steel, but because of the issue of corrosion, they are providing significant concrete cover to minimize that. But obviously, with the use of GFRP bars, we can place GFRP bars as close as possible to the concrete cover, increasing its capacity. So in this project, what we have found is just by engineering the design and, and also maximizing other benefits of using GFRP bars, uh, benefits of GFRP bars such as lightweight, then we can come up with a structure that is, that has, that will cost similarly to the traditional system, but will provide longer durability. So as part of this project, that uh, technical drawing was already approved and published by TMR and it, I believe at least uh, 10 recent projects in Queensland for boating and marine infrastructure, they have utilized GFRP bars. And we foresee that all pre-cast pre boat ramp plants in Queensland will be now reinforced with GFRP bars. So building from that project, so we have a three-year program in collaboration with, with Queensland Transport and Main Roads, supported or funded by the Advanced Queensland Industry Fellowship to explore further the use of GFRP bars for precast concrete in boating and marine infrastructure. So some of the applications that we are looking or considering is the use of GFRP bars as a reinforcement to their pontoons, floating walkways, wharves and jetties, uh, concrete piles, as well as using GFRP bars for rehabilitation of marine infrastructure. So in addition to this, uh, we are in discussion with ARTC, Australian Rail Track Corporation, in potentially <clears throat> or exploring the use of GFRP bars for tunneling and, and <clears throat> for tunneling. Uh, probably an, a number of you are aware of this uh, inland rail project that will connect Brisbane to, to Melbourne. And as part of that project, there will be a 6.8 kilometer tunnel that will, that will be built at the back or nearby uh, USQ in Toowoomba. So part of this, uh, yes, as I ind indicated, we are engaging or we are in the discussion with ARTC in potentially exploring the use of GFRP bars in the construction of this tunnel, in addition to some of the uh, composite technologies that we are developing at uh, USQ. So we are also providing education and training. <clears throat> so we have an online course on the mechanics and technology of fiber composites where obviously providing <clears throat> engineers or students on knowledge on how to design and explore the benefits of using uh, composites in different uh, engineering applications. And every two years, we, in collaboration with Composites Australia as well as Engineers Australia, 
we are also holding a technology workshops to provide practicing engineers as well as students or necessary knowledge to design structures using uh, GFRP bars. And we are also providing technology transfer to different companies on, on how to effectively design and apply GFRP bars in different uh, engineering applications. Obviously, an important component in the introduction of new uh, products is developing design codes and specifications. So USQ is uh, the leading uh, one of the uh, nomin nominated organizations as part of the uh, Australian standard development for, <coughs> for this particular technology, fiber reinforced bars. Uh, fiber enforced bars and, and the, the proposal is currently under reviewed by members of the BDO8 and under consideration by the Standards Australia. So I know we, we understand that the, the development of an, 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 of an Australian standard will take time but uh, will probably making small but uh, significant steps. So the uh, transport for New South Wales, they have recently published their technical guide on the use of GFRP bars for their asset enforcement for their uh, continuously reinforced concrete pavements. And also, yes, in, in collaboration with the Queensland Department of Main Roads, we are now drafting the technical specification for GFRP bars, which we are hoping to be published in, in March next year. So probably before I end my presentation, I would like to, to uh, share everyone some <laughs> recent findings that uh, we have found that yes, <clears throat> GFRP bars are now available and, and uh, there are many merits in using G GFRP bars as an enforcement to concrete, but uh, we would like <clears throat> based, based on our current study, because as part of the standards development, we, we, uh, we have done an ex in intensive review on, on what are the bars available in the Australian market, what, what are the properties of those bars. And these are the information that you can see in, in these slides that uh, yeah, those bars are available in the Australian market, but their properties are varying, even though they are being sold to be the same. So what we are trying to highlight here is it is important to understand the benefits of using GFRP bars, but it's also important to know the properties of GFRP bars that you are using in, let's say, in the application that you are considering. So to, to uh, summarize, so GFRP bar is now an emerging technology that can play a significant role in the Australian construction and civil infrastructure. But we need to make sure that those bars that uh, we are implementing or in introducing will meet the minimum requirements for material, physical, mechanical, and durability properties. Those, so those are very important. But fortunately, what we have found is uh, those GFRP bars available in Australia, they are in alignment with international standards such as the Canadian CSA S807 as well as the ESTM 7957. And Obviously, the complete acceptance of this uh, new reinforcing technology can be achieved by the development of materials and design standards. Thank you, everyone. So I'm just... Uh, reading some que uh, one question here. I think one, one question from our audience is, uh, what is the cost comparison between GFRP and standard steel Rio? So if I'm going, yes. <clears throat> so in, in, terms of, in terms of cost, obviously GFRP bars are probably more of a specialized reinforcement. We can consider them to be, let's say, in, in, in line with galvanized steel as well as stainless steel for specific applications where corrosion is a significant issue. 
So it ca and, and obviously that comes with with some some cost. So if we're co going to compare GIF RP bars to normal steel or let's say black steel, probably it can be twice or even up to three times more expensive. But probably what, what we need to consider there is uh, not only the initial cost, but also the, uh, the long-term uh, cost benefits of, of using non-corrosive reinforcement, as well as that ability for this particular material to be, let's say, tailored for a, for a particular application. So for example, I can give an example that I can give is the project that we have implemented with DMR with their precast boat ramp planks. If we follow, uh, if we refer, let's say, to AS3600 to achieve a certain uh, durability requirements for marine infrastructure, then we need at least a 65 millimeter concrete cover for, for our steel. But obviously that is not a problem if we are using GFRP bar, so we can reduce that concrete cover to a, a lesser thickness, thereby yes, not only utilizing the high strength properties of GFRP bars, but also minimizing the, the use of, uh, let's say, concrete, leading to a, a lighter infrastructure, if that is feasible. But again, as indicated, even let's say lower compressive steel or some of those chemicals to, to make the concrete more durable can be eliminated, eliminated as well. Okay, I'll probably answer this uh, next question before I go to the next presenter. Another question is, first, thanks for that uh, compliment. That is a very good presentation, thanks. And probably is the reason why we are doing this webinar because of the current situation, be very difficult to uh, attend in a number of conferences, but we, we thought by providing this webinar, then we can, we can <coughs> share some of the uh, activities that's going on within our center, within our university. And this question is about the strain compatibility with steel. So GFRP bars have lower stiffness compared to steel. So steel has stiffness of around 200 GPA, GFRP bars, especially for let's say that high, high modulus GFRP bars it only has a modulus of around 60 GPA. So in, in terms of strain compati compatibility, obviously uh, <coughs> if you use GFRP bars, then, then you have more deflection compared if you, if you are using the same amount of reinforcement. And those are the things that you, you need to consider in, in, in the design. And, but if you look on, let's say, if you're familiar with Canadian standard as well as the, uh, the ACI standard, what, what they do or what, what they suggested, recommend in the, in the design is uh, you can design them to be similar to steel, not, sorry, not similar to steel, but in terms of the strain limit, they are limiting the strain for GFRP FRP reinforcement similar to steel so that uh, <coughs> engineers will have, or not will have, but uh, will have easier translating their knowledge to steel to those of GFRP bars. But obviously we need to consider that the, the failure criterion. So for example, for steel, we design them to yield, but for GFRP bars, nor, uh, GFRP reinforced concrete structure, they are normally designed to have the concrete failing in compression because uh, be, before failing of the reinforcement because it, it will, because of the uh, linear elastic behavior of uh, reinforcement. But, and, and yes, by, by having the concrete, by having the structure failing by concrete in compression, then you can have a pseudo ductile behavior because obviously concrete behaves non-linear behavior in compression. I think there's another question, but probably due to time, I'll pass to our, to our next, uh, presenter, but obviously we'll answer all, or we'll, we'll collect all these questions. And after all the presenters, if we have mo more, uh, we still have time, then we're going to answer all the questions live, or we're going to answer this uh, through chat. Thank you. 
Can I invite <laughs> Ali now to share his screen? I'll probably need to stop. Thank you. Time. Can you um, stop sharing? Yeah. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Ali Mirza, and I am Associate Head of School Engagement and Outreach at the School of Civil Engineering and Surveying, the University of Southern Queensland. I'm a graduate of Curtin University, top student in geotech engineering. I have master in uh, drilling engineering and PhD in geotech from Wollongong University. And I have carried out my post, uh, postdoctoral fellowship at the School of Civil Mining and Environmental Engineering, the University of Wollongong, under supervision of distinguished professor Naj Aziz. And uh, I am recipient of a number of awards and uh, chief investigator of a number of funded projects, including more than three ACOP funded projects. Today, I'm going to talk about fiberglass rock pool load transfer mechanisms. Um, I am quite sure that by going through Alan's presentation, now you have a good understanding about what is um, GFRP and what is uh, fiberglass rock bolt. Uh, rock bolt is the same as reinforcing element that we have in civil engineering, but the difference is we use that one to support rock and soil strata rather than that of concrete. Um, the first question might be why we need to go uh, for um, fiberglass rock bolt. The reason is very simple. One is cheaper, and the second one is uh, lighter, and third one is because it is corrosion resistant. I have given a number of reasons here, and uh, the question might be, do we really use it in industry? Yes, courtesy of myself, that's the photo I have captured myself um, when I work in Sydney. Uh, so you can see here, fiberglass is used in this national level project in North Connex to strata uh, for stabilization of rock strata. So the issue that we have with fiberglass is the shear strength property. So as you know, uh, tensile strength properties of fiberglass rock pool is almost the same. Uh, when I say almost, sometimes even higher, depending on the number of fiber, um, uh, compared to those of a steel a rock pool. But the issue is shear. So, um, you probably know that when I say um, shear, so if this is rock bolt, that's the tensile or axial load uh, transfer mechanism. And when I say shear, it means that I have one strata, strata A above, B below, and that's going to resist against shear loading. So in this presentation, I want to talk about shear strength properties of this uh, fiberglass uh, product, fiberglass rock bolt. Very quickly, how fiberglass is really manufactured. That's through the process of protrusion. So we have the fiber, as I have um, shown it here, down here on the left-hand side, it goes through the resin bath. And then uh, after curing, um, you can cut it uh, on the shape and form that you want. And then you're going to have fiberglass right pulled uh, in different colors as shown here. It's sometimes like a color coded, means that some of, like if it is black represent 30 tone, if it is um, uh, green, it represents 25 tone, or et cetera. Now, um, I want to determine shear strength properties of uh, fiberglass rock pool. See how is the situation in the field. So we have rock strata, say one, two, strata A, strata B, right? We drill a hole, right, as shown here. So we have rye filling inside of that. Then we put this fiberglass inside, and then we grout it. So we have fiberglass, we have grout, but this, this is a special grout. It's different to that of civil engineering. And then we have a rock around that, okay? So you see the situation, the condition is different from what we have usually in civil engineering. So we cannot simply put it inside concrete and shear that one the same way as we do it in civil engineering. You may ask why, because industry doesn't accept it. They want us to simulate field condition, and that's why we commenced this research study. So we have two properties here, uh, two materials here. One is the fiberglass, and the other one is grout. We have to see what are properties of grout and fiberglass uh, before doing the test. So uh, the grout that we use in industry, uh, they are either 
produced by Genmar Australia or Minova. So I contacted these two companies to give us some samples. On the left-hand side, we have BU100 produced by Genmar, and the right-hand side, I have a strata binder produced by Minova. So the first uh, part of the study for me was to understand what is the uh, uh, unixial compressive strength of um, this, these products. Um, the thing is, um, when you really uh, carry out uh, encapsulating of fiberglass, I mean, to put the grout around the fiberglass, they suggest that you have to go uh, for seven liters of water for each bag of cement. But what I have seen when I worked in the mine was, uh, really, they do not follow this exactly like seven liters. So water may vary from five liters per bag up to nine. So the first question was, what is the mechanical properties of this grout um, in respect to various water content? So we made this um, mold here, and then uh, water was added to the grout, and then mixed properly to come up with a very smooth product. Then it was poured carefully inside of this cube sample with the dimension of 50, multiplying 50 and 50 centimeter, simply centimeter power three. As you can see here, very nice sample. Uh, above I have BU100, below I have a strata binder. A bit the color is different. A strata binder is a bit darker. Then um, the, product, the, the sample was positioned inside this compression testing machine and was subjected to compression testing at the rate of one millimeter per minute. This graph here, vertical axis shows water to grout ratio, ranging from 0.23 to 0.43, so as we go uh, toward the right, water increases, and on vertical axis, I have unixial compressive strength in megapascal. Blue represents a strata binder, and red represents um, BU100. So we are dealing with products with UCS ranging from 40 to 75, 70 to 73 unixial compressive strength after seven days after seven days of curing. So after this, uh, again, UCS may go a bit higher. Now, what is shear strength? For this, um, we invented this equipment. We call it punch shear testing. Um, and we produce this mold. So inside this mold, we grout the sample exactly in the same way as uh, we prepared sample for UCS. Uh, we can come up with four sample each time. So you can see one, two, three, um, four, right? And then uh, this little desk, uh, this little sample is positioned inside this um, punch shear testing, and then the whole assembly, again, sits inside, is carefully positioned inside this compression testing machine and subjected to compression loading at the rate of, again, one millimeter per minute. Again, the effect of water to grad ratio on shear strength properties after seven days was investigated. Vertical axis shows shear strength in megapascal, and horizontal axis shows water to grout ratio in um, water to grout ratio. As you can see, unlike UCS, there is a linear trend um, between UCS and water to grout ratio. As water to grout ratio increases, uh, shear strength reduces. But shear strength varies uh, for a strata binder. If I say this one, yeah, it's the strata binder varies. Um, almost from 9 to 11 megapascal. So that's the sort of material that we have. The same uh, for the other product. This is a bit more uh, susceptible to water for shear strength properties. You can see this, the uh, angle of a slope is larger. And uh, again, shear strength varies from 9 to 12. Now, we understand that we have two important materials here. One is uh, FRP, GFRP bar. Uh, as a rock mold, and the other one was grout. Now we understand what is the properties of the grout. Let's see what is the pure properties of um, fiberglass rock mold. So I'm going to go through tensile strength properties and pure shear strength properties, and then I talk about uh, the methodology that we invented to um, find out shear strength properties as observed in the field. First of all, I'm going to talk about tensile strength properties. So fiberglass is different from um, rock mold. We cannot simply put that one into tensile testing machine and grip it because fiberglass is uh, going to be broken. So we have to encapsulate it uh, inside 
um, a silt tube using high strain grout, right? And then position it in a tensile testing machine. We need to use um, either uh, some sort of LVDT like this one or um, strain gauges to find out um, displacement or strain in the middle of the sample. Um, so we made a number of samples depending uh, with various uh, exposed length. When I say exposed length, it means this one, the length which is not encapsulated. We wanted to see what is the effect of uh, exposed length on tensile load. Um, as you can see here, um, in vertical axis, we have tensile load in kilonewton. That's how we show it in mining engineering. And in horizontal axis, we have displacement. On the left-hand side, I have graphs of those products where exposed length is 20 times of the diameter. And on the right-hand side, I have um, sample with uh, larger exposed length. As we can see, uh, the tensile load, the peak load, is almost the same regardless of the exposed length, and it is around 30 tone. So I'll talk about tone always. That's how we do it in mining. Uh, we say 300 kilonewton, but the, if you divide it to 10, that's going to be tone. We say 30 tone. But what you can see, as you increase the exposed length, the stiffness of, uh, of fiberglass rock wall reduces. Um, we have done it on other products. Uh, coming from overseas, uh, and you can see, again, uh, we're coming almost to the same point, and we have done a number of sample, and the average was around 27 tons. So we are dealing with the material, with the tensile strength uh, ranging from 27 to 30 tons. What about shear strength properties? So for this, we um, manufacture this guillotine box, it's very similar to the guillotine box, box that used many years ago to cut the neck, like to cut the neck when they wanted to execute people. But the difference is here, rather than putting the neck in the guillotine box, we put this fiberglass inside the guillotine box and um, then is subjected to tensile loading, created shear failure in the sample. So you can see here, it's tensile, but that's gonna really make shear failure uh, that's pure shear failure in the sample. So results shown here, in horizontal axis, I have displacement in millimeter, and in uh, vertical axis, I have load in kilonewton. So um, the shear strength is around five tons. So you see um, it's much lower than tensile strength of the sample. So when we deal with, when we uh, use uh, a steel rock board, tensile strength is almost the same, but shear strength is around 60% of tensile strength. But here you can see that is around five tone. Compare this one to 30 tone is much lower to that of a steel uh, rock bolt. Um, again, I um, compare various products here. On the left hand side, we have some colored fiberglass. And uh, on the right hand side, I have black um, manufactured overseas. So you can see um, shear strength varies from five to six Tone, the peak value I'm talking about, right? Five to six tone. All right. Um, so I did not stop here. I decided to go for something that we call it um, double shear. When I said double shear is, we're going to have the fiberglass inside of this steel equipment, a steel instrument, and we're going to um, push it from up and down, creating shear forces align these two discontinuities. You may ask why, because that's what we have in the field. So in the field, in uh, geotech and in mining, we have different layers, right? Something like this, layer A, layer B, layer C. We have fiberglass in the middle. So this one gonna move, like one of the uh, layer gonna move. So this really represents A, this one represents B, and the last one C. We wanted to see if we're gonna have any differences here. We understand that the stiffness of this steel is very different from the rock that we have here, and we don't have grout here, but we just wanted to see what is the difference. So we carried out a number of tests again, and we figured out that there is no difference. Don't forget here, when we come up with the shear strength, we have to divide it to two, because we have two uh, shear uh, failure uh, plane. Uh, so we have to divide it to two. Again, we come up with almost five to six, 
So we can say with confidence that shear strength of this product is around five to six tone. When I say shear, it means pure shear. Now, that was not what we wanted. We wanted to simulate exact field condition. As I said, different layers. We have rock bolt. We have grout around that, right? Grout around that. And then we have rock around that. So we came up with the idea of um, this double shear testing. We have concrete blocks. We cast concrete block. Um, we had this. Um, wires here to simulate rifling because when we drill the well to put the fiberglass inside and then encapsulate it, we're gonna have rifling. So we wanted to simulate exact field condition. For that, we decided to go for these wires to exactly imprint, to exactly imprint field condition, to exactly imprint this rifling. Then we cast uh, concrete on top of that. As you can see here, three layers, so each represent one rock layer, rock layer A, B, and C. And then we encapsulated the rock bolt inside of that. So we put it inside, and then we inject the rock bolt from holes on top, right? Exactly like field condition. Then we manufacture, we manufacture this double shear still to, put con to give confinement around that, right? And then we put the whole assembly inside of this compression testing machine at the five star research facility at the Center for Future Material at the University of Southern Queensland. So you can see uh, the mold, right? So we have these uh, holes here. And we uh, encapsulated the rock bolt. So after testing, I opened the sample to see uh, what is the sort of rifling that we have. You see the quality rifling? This exactly simulates field condition. I'm so proud of this picture. Um, and you can see here, uh, here we use some sort of rope to give that rifling, right? So that's the procedure. We have confinement around that. So the middle block is pushed down, right? And this is gonna create a shear failure across two zones that we have here. Meanwhile, I put a load cell here to measure variation of axial load. Don't forget, the sample is like this. We have uh, three blocks, I have my right bolt. So I want to measure variation of this tensile load as well as this shear load that I have here, right? Okay, now look at here. Um, so I have this graph. In vertical axis, I have shear load in kilonewton, right? And in horizontal axis, I have displacement in millimeter. I have two sort of graphs. Those on top represent shear load and those on below represent the corresponding retention or tensile load, right? Again, that's a fiberglass shear and tensile, right? So you can see that tensile load increases in the same way as shear and then goes to the peak, right? Sorry, goes to the peak and then we're gonna have failure, for instance, here, there, etc. right? Look at the shear load, look at the shear load. We are getting to somewhere like 250 kilonewton or 25 ton, much larger than the ordinary method of determination of shear strength that we have, gluting box. Why? Because here the stiffness is different. We are simulating field condition. Really, we can apply this one because shear strength inside the strata, inside the strata is really larger than what we have if we just simulate it with an steel. Okay, what we can see is pretension gonna affect it when I say pretension, the initial tightening of the knot. And um, also uh, the type of the uh, fiberglass. If you have uh, fiberglass with larger tensile strength, you're gonna have usually higher shear strength as well. So that's uh, some other sort of data. This time for 60 ton concrete. So we have 40 ton and 60 ton concrete. Um, again, the type of concrete also affects shear strength properties because it's gonna increase the stiffness around the fiber glass. Um, you see, what I'm talking about is like drop uh, from an ocean of research studies that we have done. I can't even go through anything. I just have to touch and then quickly go to the next one. Um, I just invite you to go through the papers that we published from years back. Um, so after testing, I opened the sample. I dismantled the sample to see what is really uh, the failure. So you can see that's the concrete. 
that's the hole that I'm talking about, right? That's the rifling that you can see there. That's the damage subjected to the concrete due to this shear failure. And that's the failure that I have um, in fiberglass. We usually call this one damage zone or effective length. You see, it's not a pure shear failure like guillotine box that we have uh, when we have it in a, a seal guillotine box. It's very different. So we have a sh like a zone of failure. Okay, so just to put all the data together, that's the peak shear load that we can see for various type of bolt, fiberglass bolt, and that's the corresponding displacement at peak, like at the failure. And you can see various initial pretension means how I tighten that initial knot, that, that the knot that we have, and I say the knot means this one, like uh, to tighten the bolt. Um, and you can see that peak shear strength is a function of pretension, is a function of uh, UCS of concrete and even grout strength. Um, to conclude my presentation, I just want to say that water to grout ratio uh, significantly affects uh, shear and UCS uh, strength properties of grout. Um, guillotine method does not really represent shear strength properties, does not uh, determine accurately shear strength properties of fiberglass rock bolts. So rather than we suggest to use double shear testing methodology and shear strength value of fiberglass dowels, that's the name we use it in um, mining engineering, is a function of pretension load, UCS of the strata around that, and even uh, the grout, which is used to encapsulate it. And just quickly show why we need shear strength properties to uh, support the strata, my own picture, to carry out numerical simulation, that's the mine, so you can see different layers. Some of my past simulation, we have um, cable bolt, we have some of the rock bolt here. And another good picture, if none of you have been uh, around five to 600 meter below the uh, surface, below the uh, surface of the earth, um, that's how it looks like, a mechanized mine in Australia. So that's what we call it shearer or line wall mining. So this is like automated process. So coal is extracted and then goes up, uh, transported to the surface. And then this comes like forward and forward. It's quite interesting if you can go one day down, just go and see how it is. Um, finally, I wanna uh, thank the research team, my surrogate father, Professor Naj Aziz. Um, I carried out my postdoctoral post under his supervision. As I said, he's my surrogate father. My own research team, consisting of my current PhD student, Peter Ashkan and others, Heidi here um, and rest of the team. I built this group from scratch myself. Another two PhD students will yet to commence. Uh, a lot of uh, a number of new researchers that is going to be um, commenced in this uh, group. So yeah, at the end of the day, that's my email, that's my LinkedIn, that's my Google Scholar. If I were you and interested in this, I would have taken a photo of this. So be connected with me, and you will see the latest. Happy to answer questions. And if Alan allows me to go for just one second, um, I just want to quickly talk about something that might be interesting for you. So we have resource operators conference to come in the Springfield uh, in, in, in 2021 and in the Springfield campus. Um, I suggest you to register for this in one of our campuses. We have uh, around 60 accepted papers and uh, a number of uh, industry already, industry companies already uh, accepted to support this conference. And I have a good news. Um, Chief Executive Queensland Resource Council uh, accepted, uh, Jan McFarlane accepted kindly to open the conference. Those that uh, follow politics in uh, Queens, uh, in Australia, he, he, they know him. He has been the longest running uh, minister for resource in Australia. Um, for registration, just go to this website and register. We will provide um, both face-to-face and online presentation for those who are overseas and cannot come to the conference. Thank you very much. More than uh, happy to answer your question. Apart from that, enjoy your day. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Adi. Probably those questions you can find in the Q&A or chat.
probably you can you, you can respond them through uh, mail or or after all the presenters you can answer some of them live but i'll probably now invite our next colleague Vina to is it Vina? So, to give the next presentation sorry sorry sarah to give the next presentation thank you alan I share my screen, hopefully. Do you want Ali to answer the question or do you want me to start? No, no, just, just start. Yeah, start, okay. start uh, some other things. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Zara Gariniet. Sorry for the very hard surname. <laughs> you can call me Zara. I'm a senior lecturer in surveying and positioning. And today I'm going to present drones for structural health monitoring. And by the way, I'm a drone pilot, so don't freak out about CASA rules. So I can fly a drone. Uh, I think Ali and Alan, they talk about the concrete and stuff that I'm not expert. <laughs> I'm going to present a bigger picture from my perspective as a surveyor and uh, drone pilot and how they can be used for structural health monitoring. But before I go and delve into more detail, I want to say why is it important to monitor the health of the structure. Like many of you heard in the news, like last year, we had a bridge in Italy which was collapsed, killed 43 people, um, made 600 people homeless and God knows how many, uh, how much cost in occurred, which was about billion dollar, I believe. So it's important uh, to have a timely inspection for any structure. It can be a bridge, it can be a building, high rise or road. And um, the maintenance of them is very important and sadly is not done very well until catastrophic event like this happen. So if we step back and try to find out how we can make sure that we look after our structural health monitoring. We have to have periodically uh, measurement of the structure. We have to be able to measure the dynamic responses uh, to different loads, which can be traffic, people, wind, and uh, other load that can affect the behavior of the structure. We should be able to extract some features which are damage sensitive which can be done through visual inspection as well as imagery, which I'm going to talk about that. Also, we have to have some sort of predictive modeling. It's not only like I'm measuring the stuff and collecting the data. We have to have a system to put everything in the place and to be able to predict uh, what's happening with the structure and when and how we're gonna maintain that. So my question is, and your question perhaps, uh, why drone, huh? Uh, why drone is becoming a big thing. When I started using the drone, many people said, oh, drone is one of the technology will come and go. But uh, fortunately, it came and stayed. <laughs> so why we need to have drone-based inspection? There are many advantages of doing drone-based. Firstly, is like an autonomous platform. So it combined the advantage of being robotic inspection and also remote sensing through the camera array then sending someone at the top of the bridge or building to measure the thing, which is kind of risky. It also can access um, the area which is hard to reach. So is um, can measure or get the different um, data at you know, different distance and angle, which can be used for inspection specifically. And uh, I promise you, you're gonna save a lot of cost and time using the drone. Like the drone is getting cheaper and cheaper every day. And I believe uh, the use of them is getting more uh, common across uh, construction and building industry, including surveying as well. So. Uh, when we talk about drone for monitoring, there are four simple steps uh, to think about. And uh, you might think it's easy, it's not. I'm gonna show you some of the stuff we've found so far in our project and what we are heading. But first of all, you have to have a platform to 
dot, collect the data. Many people that tell me what we can collect using the drone um, is simple. Yeah, there is a camera. It can have different sensors. Uh, for inspection, obviously, you can have RGB camera, but there are other sensors like multispectral or thermal camera that you can use for other purposes. Uh, because of the time limit we have, I'm not going through them. I'm just simply using the camera and how we can use it. Uh, the, once you get all those imagery or videos or anything, you can actually construct a 3D model of your structure. It can be a building again and bridge. Uh, I'm going through a bridge example for this presentation. Um, and then you have to think, okay, I've got this 3D model, which is beautiful and is very nice, but what can I do with that? Can I measure stuff? Can I uh, do something or can I get the movement of the structure? Uh, so it's kind of feature extraction and then we're gonna evaluate and have some sort of modeling to predict the damage and what we can do about it. So going through that data acquisition, which is the very first step, uh, there are important things to consider. Uh, like, as you know, uh, as a human, we all have two eyes. There is a reason for that, because your eyes are overlapping and let you to see things 3D. Is the same principle for drones or any kind of uh, photogrammetry thing that you need to have overlap. That overlap is very important. In fact, will affect your result. I'm going to show you some of the results to see how important it is to have sort of overlap between the imagery. Also, it's important how far you're gonna take a photo from the object. Again, I show you that is very important too. So if you want to have millimeter accuracy and monitoring purpose, you gotta be careful about how you're gonna set those parameters. Also, the camera tilt or angle of incident that you take a photo is a huge factor. And one thing you might not know as a civil engineer, we call it in surveying ground control points. It's kind of like a ground thrusting. We have some targets that we have to place on the structure to be able to monitor their movement over the time. So we have their coordinates and their independent measurement. They are not done by drone, which help us to measure the accuracy of the 3D model as well as measure the movement. So I put some imagery for you. I'm gonna, in next few slides, I'm gonna present you an example of the bridge monitoring we've done with drone. Um, we are at very early stage. I'm sorry that I don't have too much uh, result, but I show you where we are heading in our project and what we are hoping to achieve. So as you can see, this is, um, sorry, I'm trying to turn on my pointer. Okay, so these are the example of, uh, you know, the mission planning uh, software you can get, you know, on your iPad or tablet, and you can use them to program the drone to do the autonomous flight uh, for you. We've done the example of the bridge, which was the five span concrete bridge in New South Wales, and we tried to come up with how this factor is actually impacting our result. So this is the result we got for the different overlaps and camera tilt. As you can see, we tested eight different configurations. Sorry, I'm not going through too much detail of them. You can read it through. But what I wanted to highlight putting this result is not about the numbers, but to give you some indication how they actually impact your results. So what you can do, uh, get from the, those app when you're flying a drone, it shows you something which call it uh, ground sampling distance. Ground sampling distance simply means uh, what's the smallest object you can measure on the image and how precisely we can measure it will be achieved by RMSE root mean square, which I hope everyone knows in this uh, session. So. Many people in industry, which is a very wrong practice, and I'm not kidding, I've talked to industry people and they feel like grand sampling distance is the accuracy of the project, which is totally wrong and I'm gonna prove it to you. So when we tested these eight different uh, flight parameters, what we found, which was interesting, as you can see, I put the red cross here for flight number four. So overlap, as I said, is very important factor. And you would think, okay, I get a drone, I go and fly and try to inspect the bridge or building is not that simple. So 
anything less than 30% side lab and uh, roughly 50%, it doesn't give you any good results. So we couldn't even process the point cloud and create a 3D model for this flight. So this is out, yeah. So you can see that's why it's important we test and we make sure we can achieve the accuracy requirement for the job as well as Australian standard for bridge inspection or any kind of um, structural health monitoring or inspection. So as you can see, I highlighted the first flight. Why was the reason for that? This was my favorite flight. I got the better result for that. So as you can see, I can have the accuracy up to four mil. And when I'm saying four mil, this has been done by $2,000 drone which is very, the cheapest one you can find in the market, DJI Phantom 4, you might know, even you have it as a toy. It's very easy to fly, it's very cheap. But imagine if I can get four mil accuracy with this type of drone, how accurate result I can get if I buy 20K drone with RTK and better quality of the camera. So uh, ground sampling was seven mil. What does it mean again? Um, it means that the smallest object I can measure in my 3D model um, is seven mil and plus or minus four mil, yeah? So four mil is your accuracy. What else we tested for bridge, uh, which is again, one of the factories affecting using drone for any kind of monitoring. And this is not a one size fit all approach. As I said, for any structure, you have to go through these steps and make sure you choose the right parameters. It's not simply a go in the field and do the drone. So what we did, we placed the targets at different places at, along the bridge. Again, this is the example of five span, so it was a, quite a long bridge. Um, we measured them uh, using the total station and we scanned them using laser scanner. The reason we did, did that to have independent measurement to make sure we can actually find the accuracy of the measurement. As you can see, I put some different geometry. By geometry, I mean how or where do you place the ground control points. Again, have a look at the RMSC and see how it is decreasing simply by putting drop, you know, tar targets in different parts of the bridges. So if you have a well-distributed GCP, which I call it a strong geometry, you're fine, yeah? But if you put all the GCP in one part and not the other part or is not distributed well enough on your structure, you're in trouble. Have a look at how much error you can get just simply by not knowing what you're doing. What we found, uh, this is actually our bridge. Um, so what we did, we created a 3D model. So I told you, once you got all those beautiful imagery, you can combine them together, you can create the 3D model. That 3D model, in fact, is not simply just for having fun or have a look at the bridge. You can actually measure stuff in that. You can measure the crack size, you can measure the coordinates, um, you can find the movement of the targets in there. It's used quite uh, significantly in my side, as far as I know, they, they calculate the volume area, stuff like that. But for monitoring purpose, you're interested into finding or detecting the area, which is like damage sensitive as I discussed very beginning. We're also interested to know, uh, you know, which part of the bridge needs maintenance. Uh, we are interested to the, you know, movement uh, subject to any loads. So, as you can see, the 3D model was pretty good um, comparing the drone I'm using, um, but there was some problem in my view, like a shadow. Like, you know, it's simple to any other imagery. Drone can have some challenges with shadow. You can see the shadow of the trees here. It can also see, or can be seen in 3D model as well, like here. Yeah, I put the close up. Um, which is no big deal if you actually know when to go and take a photograph and try to avoid it. Uh, but it can be a, uh, creating an issue for you if you don't take it right, in right angle or in different time of the day. So um, this is what we've done so far, what we're hoping to do. Yeah, I'm going through the, the next step we're trying to do is like to be able to use, use those imagery to 
automatically detect the features and cracks or something which is important in inspection. And we would be able to say which part of the bridge has uh, the problem and needs the maintenance and repair. And we are hoping to create an automated platform for that. So we don't need to have any human interpretation like what we have as a visual inspector. So this is an example I want to show you what it looks like, yeah? So yeah, we got the feature extracted, but we want to also say how big is the damage, yeah? Not all the damage re needs repair uh, and how frequently you're gonna maintain or repair them. It really depends on the significance and where it's happening. So uh, this is the next step that we are trying to do. So what I found challenging with drone itself that we're trying to solve this with our project, which I'm going to show in next slide, sorry, bear with me, um, is like drone is, yeah, it's perfect. It can get all the imagery you want, 3D model measurement. Uh, yes, it's fantastic. But like any other technology or method, it has its challenges. What is the challenge with the drone um, or unmanned aerial vehicle, if you know the other name? When they get closer to the uh, like drones or anything with GPS, basically, if you've got a GPS and you ever drove to the tunnel, you notice that you're losing the signal. Yep, it's the same story with drones. So as drone is flying near the structure, it's the signal from GPS is getting obstructed by, especially for underneath of the bridge, it's getting obstructed and you cannot get, uh, yes, you can get the imagery, yeah, but uh, the movement wise and measuring wise is cannot be as accurate as we hope, which is few mil. But what we are trying to do using um, our team, like my team in, in CFM, uh, including Vina and DNAMIR, which having a project that we're trying to combine drone with DIC digital image correlation system, which has the ability to do dynamic uh, monitoring of the bridge. So the good thing about having a terrestrial platform as well as aerial is we can combine them together and we can have a fantastic temporal and spatial resolution for monitoring of any structural uh, health. So this is what we're doing. Sorry again, we are very, uh, like we just finished the first stage. We're hoping to go through the uh, stage two and three and trying to complete the project by end of this year. And we hope that we can uh, use our platform and collaborate with our industry partner. But the hope or the big picture for our project is, yes, we want to combine the IC with drone imagery. We would be also like to have a big platform um, like BEAM, which is building information modeling. So yeah, we got all this information at different epochs. Yeah, what we're gonna do about it? Where are we gonna place it? How are we gonna access it? The building information modeling is enabling us to put everything in one place for a decision makers or policy maker to be able to access and find out what happened. Look at the time series analysis, the deformation, deflection, um, all those information in one place. And I think that would be a significant achievement if we can prove this approach is working. We got the $15,000 from USQ to build our capacity as a team on this project. And um, I can see a very bright future for our project, hopefully. Uh, yeah, this was my presentation. Thank you for listening to me. And this is my email address if you want to contact me. Thank you, everyone. Hey, Sarah, I think there's uh, one question in the chat, which you would like to answer live now. Yep. Uh, Andrew asks, can you, can you ever just use a base station to sort out the GPS loss? It can be used uh, RTK, real-time kinematic, or PPK, uh, which is post uh, kinematic GPS in a way. Yes, that can, but it doesn't solve the problem with multi-path. Um, that base station is only helping you to get more accurate result, but it doesn't help you with the multi-path error, which happening with the signal deflected from the structure and give you the wrong position anyway. But yeah, that definitely helps with having more precise results. 
I think I'm good. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Uh, Wina, probably we can now start your presentation. Thanks. Uh, Wina, I think you're on mute. I had an issue this morning too. Maybe yeah, that, really yeah, yeah. That, no that's all right. I, I go with this. All right. Thank you very much for the invitation to uh, speak in this webinar. And I'm going to talk about the pi rehabilitation using composites. Um, so we all know that our existing bridge stock is like this. So they have been built long time ago. We can see we have timber bridges and also we have non-timber. Most of them are concrete bridges. And as per Alan's uh, presentation at the very beginning, after 30 years, concrete uh, structures starts deteriorating. So we can see that we are in a very, uh, we should be in a very attentive mode at the moment, we need to look after our aging infrastructure. So what we have done in this space is that we have been working on the bridge deterioration for quite some time now. So we have been uh, investigating to see what are the elements of the bridges which are most vulnerable. So we have been doing whole tree analysis. These are statistical types of analysis. So the bridges uh, are deteriorated due to many, many reasons, environmental situations mostly. And there could be impact loads coming from different uh, situations. So when we talk about the bridge deterioration, this gives us a bit of an idea of the most vulnerable elements. So we came up with piles and head stops as the most vulnerable uh, bridge elements. So we identified the deterioration mechanisms and then we used faulty diagrams to figure out what are, what are the most important elements to look at. So we moved into the bridge pile deterioration as a result of our previous investigations. So we can see that we have three different materials uh, used for bridge construction, bridge pile construction. So at the moment we are using uh, composites also, but I haven't included it here because these are the main, main materials used in our old bridges. So when we have deteriorated uh, piles, we need to either repair, replace, or retrofit them to maintain their functionality. So we first looked at timber bridges and then we look, We are looking at reinforced concrete bridges as well. So at the moment I'm working with the company uh, Quake Prep Australia. So they are the, the people who are providing us the materials and also we got the Innovation Connection Grant to proceed with this uh, research. So timber piles, these, all these figures are from the industry, uh, Quake Trap Australia. So we started looking at these timber piles that they have been retrofitting. So you can see there are many, many uh, cross-section losses due to many reasons. So our target is to somehow rehabilitate these piles, whether they are timber piles or concrete piles. So the approach we use is a FRP wrapping system. What we do there is, we, for example, we have the timber pile here, and then we have the FRP wrapping system going around, and then we have the annulus in between the existing timber pile and the FRP wrap. 
and then we fill that annulus using different materials. So that's the process we use in our FRP wrapping system. And what we do at the very beginning is there are a few materials involved in here, uh, FRP laminate, and then we have the filler materials, as well as for timber and also concrete, reinforced concrete. So at the very beginning, we started the project with material characterization of the materials quake wrap is using. So timber, uh, the FRP laminate is the one we first tested for tensile, uh, shear, compression, and then the burnout test. And then we figured out how the fibers are oriented in the laminate, in the axial direction, as well as the transverse direction. We know that there are many FRP laminates, uh, especially the Wagner's one, they have the plus 45, minus 45 uh, fibers as well. But in this laminate, we only have zero and 90 degrees for the fibers. So we tested the material laminate for the basic material properties because we wanted to do a good uh, finite element analysis also in terms of conducting a parametric analysis. So uh, we started the project with an undergraduate student, on our student, he's in the audience, Rami, and we started with timber piles, and at the very beginning, we investigated about the splitting of timber piles, and then we created this split and then we wrap the FRP around this timber pile. We investigated only short columns at that stage and then we filled the space between the timber and the FRP with the filler material and we tested them for compression in this uh, on a student project. So this is what we came up with. So this is the strength axial load and displacement for the control sample. And we can see when we use um, filler materials and with the FRP wrapping system, the axial load capacity is increasing. So we started working with the finite element analysis as well to see whether we can predict the expected uh, experimental behavior. So we, we were able to get the um, numerical analysis in a close match with the experimental results. So this is the basis for our parametric study to see whether when we change the uh, thickness of the FRP laminate or when we change the thickness of the annulus or when we change the location of our location or the overlap of the FRP laminate when we do the wrapping. So we are going to use a similar model to investigate those parameters in the parametric study. And also at the same time, time we have a PhD student working on this project and uh, we are looking into the flexural behavior of timber piles with the FRP wrapping system. The main reason is we know that the uh, timber timber or whatever the timber uh, bridge here so the piles are mainly taking the axial load however there is wind we are going to get a stone soon so due to this wind loadings we need to know how the piles will act for these wind loadings so we need to make sure that they are doing the right thing uh, that we wanted them to behave like um, Next part of the uh, project is reinforced concrete bridge piles. Again, we have tested the material properties for concrete. We have the cementitious ground and then we have the epoxy. So we can see that when we have concrete unconfined, these are the axial behavior. And then we, when we just confine them with our FRP wrapping, what's the situation? So when the uh, for the drought, we can see a small increment. For concrete, we can see a huge increment in the axial load. And also, when we use epoxy, epoxy is anyway giving us a very high axial uh, compression load. 
when we wrap it, it does not increase quite a lot. So this test, we have done many samples to make sure that our test results are giving us the correct results. So after this uh, compression testing, we also conducted the flexural testing for reinforced concrete samples. So what we have done is this is our control one, uh, just the reinforced concrete sample. And then we wanted to wrap it just with the GFRP jacket. That's not very common in the uh, in the industry real practice but at the same time we wanted to do the reinforced concrete pile wrapped with frp and then filled with grout cementitious grout as well as epoxy infill so these are the two uh, types of filler materials that quakecraft is using at the moment so we developed uh, an experimental program to do, uh, test the full scale samples. They are 1.2 meter long samples. And as you can see, we did the control sample to make sure that uh, we wanted to see the uh, strength enhancement. And then we did the wrapped samples as well. We used three point bending here and we use the big frame in uh, P11 at uh, Tumba campus in testing these. So these are the test results we obtained. We can see the black curve is for the unconfined one. And we can see the cracks here at the tension uh, side. And also when we just wrap the uh, control sample with GFRP, the red curve, it's giving a higher strength. However, it fails suddenly. And when we have the uh, sample and the wrapping system together with the cementitious grout in fill, we could see initially a close match with only the GFRP wrap sample. However, the loads are going higher and also the post peak region is a little bit more ductile than the other samples. And also we saw that when we have the epoxy in field, we are having a higher lecture load, although we are having a quick or sudden failure in the end. However, we can see these two grout in field and epoxy in field are the common methods. We can see uh, compared to the control sample, we can see a larger energy absorption as well as a larger deflection in these areas. So with this, we have moved on to our experimental investigation as well as the numerical one. So we can see our finite element results are coming close to our experimental results, except for this one. So this is our control one. This is the control sample just trapped with the FRP. And these are the two filler materials. And you can see from our, this is the half the model that we have shown here. You can see the stress distributions, the change in the stress distributions, especially when we have this um, grout and epoxy in things here. So that's the experimental part that we have done. Uh, Quake Cap really wanted us, wanted us to do these tests to make sure that they can optimize their material usage in this rehabilitation. So these are some of the applications that they reported me proudly. So Pony Club Footbridge, uh, Brisbane City Council, they have uh, repaired four piles there. And I think in this Tulumba Bridge timber piles, they have replaced, uh, they have repa repaired about 40 piles. And in the pipeline jetty timber piles, they have repaired about 100 piles there. So in these systems, they are using the FRP system together with 
uh, either cementitious ground or the epoxy ground. So the customer satisfaction was like uh, it's cost effective and very easy to because they are working with the laminate and it's easy to um, fit into the context and then fast installation. So I'm very happy about the projects at the moment. So we are moving forward uh, by adding a bit of sustainability into the projects as well. We want to uh, see whether we can include recycled glass in this cementitious cloud and also epoxy. That's our future way forward. And I thank you very much uh, and a special thanks to Quakerap Australia and also CFM at the USQ and also colleagues and the students who are providing insights in very, very different perspectives that makes our projects very, very valuable. Thank you. Uh, thank, thanks, Vina. Vina, there's uh, one question in the Q&A, but can you just probably answer that uh, through typing because uh, we, we time is now limiting. So we yeah. now invite our last presenter from our industry partner to oh, Tom to share your screen and make the presentation. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Alan. Is that working? Yep, all good from my side, Tom. Thanks. Okay. Uh, um, we probably need to your display settings to be checked, change to just one more. Can you see two monitors? Yeah, just go to your display settings. Let me just get rid of one monitor. Sorry. It's on top. Yep. Okay. Is that just the, the title screen there? All good now. Thanks. Okay. Um, so thanks, Alan. Um, just a bit of an introduction for myself. Um, my name is Tom Heyer. I'm the business manager for specialty products uh, at Austrac. So um, Austrac's been working with USQ um, on a research grant, a COCP research grant over the last few years on the development of composite railway sleepers. So um, what I'd like to go into today um, is probably a bit less on the technical side of, of what things are happening, but a bit more perspective on where the industry sort of views and the adoption of composite technologies in what um, would typically be a very conservative, um, you know, your more classic concrete timber materials and what that's been like for us um, in both getting adoption from the network operators and, and standards, et cetera. So um, what I wanted to talk about uh, is just highlighted here a little bit, which is what, where the value comes from in using composite technology in the railway industry. Um, also, what various types of composite materials are currently um, being used and um, what, it's an interesting definition what they define as um, you know, composite or alternative materials compared with um, maybe in a bit more in the research space. Um, then we'll go into just what does the Austrac uh, composite sleeper uh, and some of the design principles look like, some of the advantages of that that we're working on um, in partnership with USQ. And then a little bit about specifically the, the research achievements and, and some of the next steps that we have as, as part of our, our research program. So this is just a little bit of information on Austrac. Um, we were incorporated in 1980. Um, in uh, two years ago, we were purchased by Voslo, which is a global railway uh, infrastructure company based out of Germany. Um, we have supplied over 21 million sleepers, um, over uh, 12 different factories that have been um, generally opened close to the, the main projects um, that they're required for. At the moment, there are four concrete sleeper facilities in operation uh, in Wagga Wagga, Rockhampton, Geelong, and in the Pilbara in Port Hedland. So um, you see that's just an aerial shot of one of our facilities, um, some standard sleepers, and then some of the more um, complex type 
products such as turnout pairs, which is what I look after, the, the specialty products, um, which are some of your more um, specialized concrete components, some level crossing components, and then our composite products fall under that department as well. So for the railway industry, um, the main driver for composites really is a timber sleeper replacement or, or a timber component replacement. Um, the Australian railway lines uh, require around 1.5 million timber sleepers per year. Um, now that there are much stronger limitations on the type of treatments such as creosote that they can use to extend the lifeline of those products, um, they are becoming increasingly um, the, or their, their duration in track is being reduced. It can be you know, 10 to 20 years, but depending on the location, even less than that. The cost of some of the more um, desirable hardwood timbers is becoming more expensive. So, I mean, you can see in some of these photos, which, you know, the condition of some of these sleepers as they're pulling them out of track, then also the cost of um, that operation to pull them out and replace them is becoming an increasing problem. And they're looking for a, um, a technology that can be a suitable replacement for that. So uh, obviously, Austrac's first, um, I guess, solution would be why not use concrete sleepers? Concrete sleepers um, are not that much more expensive than timber. They are a very suitable um, uh, material to be used for railway lines, um, very stable. Um, add a lot of track stiffness, which is good, but um, they are a number of reasons why you can't do a direct spot replacement. So, so what that means is if you were to build an entirely new railway line from a point A to point B, it's hard to compete with concrete. However, of all the thousands of kilometers of track that are already timber, what generally they want to do is just upgrade that line to a product that would last for 50 years but can perform similar to timber. So um, you're looking for stiffness and mechanical properties, also a depth to the product that matches. Um, also the methodology that you install these. Um, if you look down below, you can see, you know, concrete sleepers have the fastening system which connects your rail to the sleeper, which is cast into the product. Um, what they need is a technology that you can just slide it underneath the rail, drill directly into it, and, and fasten the plates, uh, which they do for timber. So that is where composite technology really comes into play. Another area for, that's uh, a bit more specialized um, as a niche railway application, but is a particularly valuable um, market for this type of technology is bridge transoms. So when you look at the diagram there, you can see that bridge transoms, while they're, they're just a maybe a large sleeper, the support structure underneath, instead of having standard ballast, will be the girder assembly of the bridge. Now that means a notably different um, uh, loading and, and structural requirements for that product and concrete is not a suitable product um, for bridge transoms really in almost all cases. So um, the need for I guess the the network operators to identify a solution you know instead of just you know continuing to use hardwood timber is is quite high. So this is uh, just a typical example of one of the bridge transoms in the uh, ARTC network, which is the Australian Railway Track Corporation operating really mostly in New South Wales to Victoria to South Australia. Um, and there's, you can see quite a high degree of variability in the bridge setup. So having that flexibility of where you put your connection points to the bridge structure um, is, is quite important. Um, another uh, aspect of this design, which has been important as, as we do the research, is some of the things that um, aren't very well understood. You can see here as, as a mainline track transitions onto a bridge, the support structure underneath is very difficult to maintain. It's quite a um, shift in stiffness going from the, the mainline track to the bridge. 
And so what that means is very, very high impact loads going from, um, you know, on those first or last transoms on the bridge. And this is something that, you know, you, you won't really have well characterized, you know, the railway networks don't understand this very well themselves. So part of this research project is, is helping them be able to quantify that, create design inputs, um, you know, for um, both designing the, the, the transom product, but as well for the train operator or the network operators to know um, what type of loads those are experiencing. So the next thing I wanted to, to touch on, which, which may be a bit different, but in the railway industry, they the composite technologies have been um, floating around in, in sort of a minor way, probably for the last 20 years. And there's quite a spectrum of, of what they mean when they say that. And, and I guess on the lower end of that spectrum would be some of your thermoplastics. So there are a number of different companies and products made of, um, you know, some combination of engineered plastic, recycled plastic. A number of them use steel um, reinforcement bars to add additional stiffness. So um, obviously this um, presents some environmental advantages. Um, there are a number of different uh, polymer mix designs that you can use to try and get the performance you want. But generally, these are typically on the lower end of the spectrum um, of products that are available and, and probably something that, that I imagine, you know, a lot more of the, the industries working in this research wouldn't classically define as, as composite technology. One, the, the next technology that is um, quite successful in this space is a fiber reinforced foam urethane known as FFU. Um, this is unidirectional fiberglass with a polyurethane foam. Um, the main supplier of this is a Japanese company called Sakasui. It um, actually performs quite well in track. It has a look and feel quite similar to timber. Um, and I guess one of the major drawbacks of it more than anything is the cost. So if you if a class if a standard timber sleeper um, is around you know seventy to eighty dollars a equivalent concrete sleeper, you know, 100 to 110. Um, an FFU sleeper could be, you know, 350 to $400. So it becomes um, a much more niche um, product for specialized applications. It is successful in bridge um, applications, but it's not something to replace the large volume of timber sleepers um, just because of that cost. So that's where I guess Oztrax looking to sort of bridge that gap between a, a high performing product, but that also can hit some of those commercial targets to make it feasible um, at, a, at a much larger volume. So this is a very simple diagram, which we use in presentations to give an overview um, of what our product is. We use um, glass, uh, fiberglass, fiberglass laminates for the structural components. With a um, resin, we use a mix of either epoxy resins or polyester resins um, with a number of fillers. The fillers could be ones to add UV protection, um, fire retardants, um, or just lightweight fillers to take up the volume. Um, and then the manufacturing process, essentially just curing those in an oven to achieve the um, end sleeper. So in the bottom right, you can see an example of a few of the sleepers we've manufactured over the last few years. Um, you can see some of the flexibility in, in the shape, you know, whereas some of the, the FFU, the recycled plastic, you really are limited to that classic rectangular shape. Whereas that front one, we, we sort of label as a dog bone sleeper. That is all you would need to um, achieve the structural or track performance. Um, for what the sleeper does in track. And then the middle would be a bit of a hybrid between the two to, I guess, maybe fit a bit more in their installation equipment and, and processes. So um, some of the things that um, are work well with the composite technology that we are um, developing is an incredibly high strength to size uh, and weight ratio. So what you can see there, the smallest 
concrete sleeper that Austrack supplies is around 150 mil. This is a low profile concrete uh, narrow gauge design. Um, we could design an equivalent composite sleeper at 111 mil and, and probably even less than that. So the advantages to that of slipping that inside of existing track structure where you don't want to have to um, redo the subgrade or, or ballast or maybe you have some overhead um, electrification um, infrastructure that you're trying to work within is a major advantage. Um, so we already talked, you, you have that high level of customization with different shapes. Um, that can be an advantage depending on what the application is. You can see um, in the bottom middle photo, um, it is also suitable for cast and fastenings and, and the grooves that you see are to add some additional lateral stability for the performance and track. One of the applications that is um, quite uh, an advantage for um, network operators is, is actually to move away from your standard bridge transom to bridge decks. So composite technologies can be used for bridge decks. This um, really offers a number of safety advantages and maintenance advantages to them. Um, and, and one of the key differentiators from our perspective compared with a lot of the thermoplastic alternatives um, you can see at the top is that you don't have any issues with um, thermal um, coefe coefficient expansion happening. Um, you can imagine in very hot days with a large steel rails sitting on top of the sleepers, the risk of there being an expansion in the top layers of a thermoplastic and therefore bending the sleeper and, and moving the rail gauge, which is the distance between the two rails, is a major issue for, for some of these technologies in track. So that's an advantage of using um, the, this, this type of technology. A main one as well, um, and there's a video that, that was sort of not working, but it must be drillable. Um, it's something that they really, the preference for them to have something that essentially functions from a, a process standpoint, just like timber does, is, is critical for adoption. Um, so they're not interested in sort of switching to, to different types of screws, um, drilling equipment. So while, while frustrating, it's, it's a clear constraint to get um, uptake amongst um, the network operators. So uh, another area that has been quite challenging for um, adoption in the railway space is, is really a lack of understanding and, and standards and specifications uh, available for people to understand what is it that um, there are advantages and where are the risks in using these type of technologies. So um, up until earlier this year, some of the only two standards, there was a Japanese standard um, called the GIS E1203. There was also an American standard, an ARENA standard for engineered composite ties. Um, both of these were heavily influenced by, um, I would say, the incumbent technology. So the, the top standard was very geared towards that FFU Sakasui technology. The ARENA standard um, very much written around a lot of the thermoplastic um, sleepers that have been on the market for the last um, decade or so. And what you find, this is an excerpt of a railway authorities assessment comparing um, sleepers that had passed all of the standards, all of the testing required in the standards versus what they were finding um, of these in track. And, and essentially um, you'd have a number of sleepers pass all of the um, type testing requirements and after a few years, they would start to develop cracks that have a number of different failure modes. And so there's a recognition that um, the standards need to probably be updated and, and made a bit more robust. Um, earlier this year, Australia developed its own railway standard. So the AS1085 series that you see here under the RISB banner is all about railway infrastructure. Um, so section 22 is about alternative material sleepers. The difficulty with this and, and both Austrack as well as um, members of USQ sat on the committee, the development committee for this, is trying to develop a standard that both um, sets guidelines for 
what the Austrac technology does using fiberglass laminates as well as thermoplastics can be challenging and, and you have to do a number of concessions and it becomes a little bit more of a performance standard. So um, it's a major first step in, in the right direction, but um, probably has some, some areas of improvement as well as it becomes a bit more um, utilized over time for, for different railway clients. So um, this, what, what I wanted to go into next was just a little bit more information about the work that's being accomplished um, under the CRCP grant between, the, um, between USQ and Austrac. So that was a three million matched federal funding grant for research and development um, to really commercialize a number of different composite railway products. So that had four different research streams associated with it, um, including design techniques, new materials and forms, manufacturing processes, and then testing, which is both you know, lab testing and in-track testing. So we initiated that in um, quarter one, 2018. And these are just a couple of images from, from test reports and different um, programs that, that have, um, I guess, been worked on over the last couple of years, which has really helped both Austrac um, optimize the technology for commercialization, um, but also give enough confidence and, um, I guess, reputational backing to some of the clients who really don't know what it is that they need or, or what they're looking for. So, some of the key aspects of that that I, I wanted to just pr probably end on are things that are a bit harder to classify, right? So it, it's quite straightforward to test a sleeper as to, well, what's the bending moment capacity of that sleeper? And, um, you know, there's a, a pretty straightforward test that you can do that and compare it against, you know, well, what does timber give you? What does concrete give you? But um, one of the things that is a major issue when you have railway lines with lighter sleepers. So timber is quite light, you know, relative to concrete. Um, composite sleepers are generally quite light as well, is how well those sleepers um, remain in the position and track. So you may have on curves a number of lateral forces that will shift the, the, the entire line if there's not enough lateral stability um, inherent in those sleepers. So what that means is the track, the overall track geometry can over time start to become warped and major maintenance headaches and, and issues for um, the overall track. And it's a very difficult thing to quantify and classify what is the lateral stability performance of your sleeper. So working, you know, through this program, we were able to set up, um, you know, large ballast boxes, um, create some experiments and, and compare how well do different shapes, different materials um, perform and, and feed that data back to um, some of the potential clients, which is key. Um, another one I think that, that has been a real sort of eye opener is making sure that everyone understands the um, difference between lab testing and infield testing. So um, on the right, you can see we've performed, you know, dozens and dozens of uh, pull-out tests where you put a standard rail spike um, or rail screw into your product, pull it out and see um, what force uh, it's able to withstand for a pull-out force, because obviously those screws are essentially holding your rail down. Um, now, the realities of the way that they install these in track, some of the equipment they use, some of the real life conditions, there is a very large disparity between lab testing. And, and this isn't just for, for Austrac sleepers, this is for um, all products and what type of field testing they get. So this program and, and some of the things that we've been able to work with the clients on is really highlighting where some of those key challenges are, um, what is the um, some potential solutions to address that or, or tests that may be able to better characterize um, what those look like. So, so that's been a, a major, um, I guess, success, success as part of the um, research program. 
Um, and another element that, that's been very valuable is doing um, some of the FEA modeling in, in different, um, more um, longer term characterization of what the products are. So typically what you will need to get an approval from a railway authority is to do fatigue testing, um, typically no more than 3 million cycles. So um, that is not really telling you whether a new product is actually gonna last for 50 years in track of, of um, you know, what they're requesting. Um, and so working with USQ, we're able to, you know, put together some models and, and identify where are the longer term failure points of the product, you know, what are the areas that maybe need to be reinforced or areas potentially to save on materials, um, because that is a theme that we really um, have found uh, comparing with something like concrete, the cost of these materials um, is, is very key to make sure that we optimize. So. Just to close on is, well, what's next as, as this partnership and, and for the commercialization? So the key thing um, really for any railway product is you have to get type approval. Um, and the focus at the moment is getting type approval with Queensland Rail and ARTC. Um, what that essentially means is passing all of their criteria um, from the engineering teams and getting approval to do a field trial. And they'll typically do a field trial of keeping sleepers in track for you know, 12 months or 18 months, depending on um, you know, what, the, what the specifics are. So we'll continue to do a lot of the validation testing on those products, um, as well as product optimization. So you know, making sure that areas um, that we can save on material usage or using um, lower cost materials is critical to have a sleeper that works because Ultimately, if you have a sleeper that, that does everything they want, but it costs, you know, four or five times the cost of timber, they will continue just to use timber and bear the cost of taking them out after eight years and putting new ones in. Um, and then also, um, obviously, we were doing a lot of good work with a number of the, the PhD student teams, and, and there's been a number of um, uh, thesis and, and, and manuscripts published, which has been, um, I think, a, a major success for the project as well. So I just put um, as well, you know, I'm probably not the best person in the Austrac side to go into too much of the technical side of things um, for the composite product, but happy to, of course, field any um, questions uh, regarding um, this product or, or, or the, the railway industry as well. Uh, thanks very much, Tom, for the presentation. Uh, if you can probably check, check the Q&A, there's one question addressed to you. <clears throat> Asking about the cost. Yes. The cost. So the target um, for a GFR pre, GFRP sleeper is around double the cost of timber. So if timber costs between 70 and 80, they're really looking for a product to cost um, at, at a max of $160. So that's based off financial modeling that they've done um, to sort of compare um, for that longer uh, or that longevity of the product versus you know, the maintenance costs. So that has been something that um, generally we're working within. And those will vary depending on what the, um, uh, I guess, exact application is. But uh, that's the ballpark that we're, we're typically working within. Thanks, Tom. And Ali, I'm not sure if you can still hear me. Uh, there's one question uh, addressed to you. If you can probably answer that uh, in, the, in the next two minutes. You're still on mute, my What friend. question it was? Uh, what was the question? Yes, I think it's about your rock bolt failing in shear. I responded that. Um, so no, in I... many cases, yes, a rock bolt, actually that, that's uh, where they fail, mostly in shear. So layers start to move and creating shear failure in the rock bolt. Yeah, that's main reason for failure in rock bolt. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, I think yeah, we only have two minutes left, so we just probably would like to utilize uh, that time to uh, <clears throat> thanks our presenters and also our participants. <clears throat> if there are probably answer questions that uh, you would like to ask or information that uh, you would like to know further, feel free to uh, send an email directly to the presenter or to any one of us. We can we can direct obviously we can direct that question to the appropriate researcher. And again, we <clears throat> will probably close this session now and uh, we'll see you again in our next webinar. Thanks everyone. <clears throat>